I can be playful and wild and splat clay around and grab things out of the dumpsters and be really like cavalier and crazy and wild artist, you know, but I can also, along the way, I learn so much. I went to Catholic school and I remember there was an art teacher that would come around like once a week, you know, or once a month. So we really didn't have much art growing up until I got to high school. I took an art class, Art 101 or whatever, as a freshman and I saw these people on the pottery wheels back in the corner and I was like, oh, that's cool. What's that? And I want to do that. And Mr. Smith, Smitty, was like, you got, no, you're not allowed to do that until you're in art two or whatever. You got to pass art one. And so it was like motivation for me to like learn these dates and things that are long forgotten of like, you know, Rubenesque paintings or something. And now, but I got, I finally, you know, was able to get on the wheel. And within like months, I was like addicted or within days, but within months I was like, you know, that was my new place. And I like, was there, you know, as much as I could and always the dirty, you know, kid showing up late to class with like, you know, clay all over his pants. Um, stayed after school a bunch to throw on the wheel. And I got really good at throwing on the wheel when I was in high school. Um, and then I was, I thought I was going to be a, the joke is I was going to either be a fireman or a stuntman. <laughs> that was, that was my goal, right? Those are my dreams. And my mom was like, you have to go to college. You have to try college. You have to try college. I'm from a family where you got to try to college. And so I went and just sort of kept going undecided until I had a friend who was a uh, history. He was in history and he was going to be a history teacher, a high school history teacher. And he was like, dude, you should be an art teacher. You know, we, you know what the best part about being a teacher is? I'm like, what? He's like, the best three things. I'm like, what, what are the best three things? He's like, June, July, and August. <laughs> I landed a job at Levitt Area High School on a phone call and a drive out and an interview and a handshake. And I moved there and lived there seven years. That was the first time I was really an artist. I rented a studio, like on my own without school, you know, rented a studio, taught in the day, ate dinner and went back to the studio at night till like 10, 11, 12 at night. And then, go, and then just really started creating bodies of work and having shows and pushing the work and pushing myself. And, uh, yeah, I teach, I teach high school. Um, I, I always knew I was good with kids. You know, you know, some people are good with kids and some people aren't like, it's like, I was always playful and silly and goofy and fun. And I try to keep that, you know, as much as life, it gets you more and more serious as you get older. I find myself getting more serious. I have to like check myself because silly and fun and connecting with young people is like really invigorating. You know, I tell kids all the time that day one, I'm not here to make, to make you go to art school. Like you better think long and hard about that decision, you know? Um, but if art's in your life and creativity, I really value and think, you know, whether it's the, you're a plumber or you're the president, like you need to problem solve. And the best problem solvers are really um, people who thrive in life. You make more money, you're, you accelerate in your career. If you're a problem solver, people want to work with you. Um, and art is like clearly problem solving 100% of the time, you know? So with, I, I basically, that's what I tell kids. We're not making art, we're just problem solving. And we're using like line, shape, color, value, space, form, texture, you know, all these things. And mud or clay or paint is our material, you know, to do that with. And being all the while, like living in Maine, rurally, um, with all those connections of in the cycle um, and Western Maine with, you know, snow and um, landscape and rivers and mountains and people and all the, you know, different things that I've never experienced coming from a flat land farm, you know, corn, you know, like the outside of Columbus, Ohio is just corn, you know, so it's flat. It's not, we don't have as much nature and the rivers are polluted and, you know, it's an industrial state. So I really like thrived here, like net with nature and it affected my work big time. This region has an old history of clay. There's like, you know, deposits of marine blue clay in Maine the history of that is there was brick makers in this area where, you know, I'm talking late 1700s, 
specifically Dan Scott River Brick is what I know a lot about. And that's what built like Portland streets in Boston and even buildings in New York City. There's a, a, a beach nearby called Brick Beach and it's just fragments of like the bricks that blew up or didn't or bloated and they just throw them to the side. So it's just washing up and down the tide. You find little brick chunks everywhere. Um, and there's, you know, buildings built out of them. You can like, you see a brick building in Maine that's old. It was probably built out of river brick from the mid coast region. I just like dreamed to live in a place like this. It was like, it really is like a vacation to me in a lot of ways. Um, so that just, Living in Maine, too, if, if nature doesn't affect you in some way by living in Maine, let alone rural Maine, I mean, you're not, like, breathing. I don't know, because it's just everywhere. It's so It impacts so much of my life, even if I didn't want it to, um, that just part of the cycle and, and connection to Earth really connected me to literally the, the surf, the clay that I use as the surface you know, of the earth all the way to my layered pieces are just like a document or a time capsule of geology a little bit. Um, and then also being an environmentalist and just living, you know, I just had a hard time like buying materials that were shipped from California and um, that were probably mined in China or wherever. So finding and resourcing local and, and seconds and used and clay and glazes um, and other materials. And I'm a, you know, I was always a dumpster diver. Like, you know, I, I try and find in as much as I can. Um, so everything that pretty much you're gonna see was reclaimed, found, I didn't buy it. In ceramics, really, you know, in and you if you work around a university um, or even in a high school, there's just so much reclaim and waste and things that go, um, things that people don't use anymore. You know, there's just like buildings full or like, you know, tractor trailer trucks full of like question mark glazes and clay that got plaster in it or clay that nobody knows what it is or materials that don't, nobody wants to use. Um, so places like colleges, uh, fact, you know, it's tile factories, um, anyone that's using a material, there's just so much waste. So I basically just, People give it to me at this point, you know. I'm also attracted to that kind of wabi sabi, rough um, art, brute um, art. You know, like like outsider art look. I'm I I've always been attracted to that. It has this inherent story of what it was before, and now it's reinvented or recontextualized or remade or rearted. You know, so I love doing that. I like taking something old and making it new again. I, I try and find a lot of clay and. And in a lot of variety of clays, um, and there's actually, this is a great, you know, you can see my buckets here and I will test them and find out, you know, I'll, I'll mix them up and test them and find out if I've got clumpy or glossy or, or chunky. Um, so I will imagine take a cart of 25 cardboard boxes and form them and that's sculpting in its own. And I tape them and put cinder blocks around them and tape them to a, you know, a table leg and, because I'm going to be pouring wet material and it tends to like ooze and open up. So I'll, you know, start my, start a first pour, or maybe I'll sprinkle in some, some dry clay as well. And I just start pouring a couple layers and then I'll wait a few days. I'll pour slowly in these layers, right? And I'll change color and I, I'll, I will, I try to be good. I'm a little haphazard, but I'll write down like layers as I go and keep track and like, okay, I'm keeping this one more like cool and this one warm and this one's the wild one. Um, and I'll do things along the way. And it's just like, I should, I go, I show up. How do I feel? Oh, these cracked a little, I might roll out a slab and sprinkle a bunch of materials in there and roll it up like a sushi and cut them up and put those in around. So I get some variety and you'll see those in there. Like they almost look like bones sticking through when I cut them. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll put dried dried or already fired brick brick pieces in there. I'll, um, hay and straw ends up in there and dirt and all the stuff along the way uh, and just slowly pour those layers. And my work is really thick and so and, and solid. So conventional conventionally they would tell you like you can never fire a solid object. I mean because like, it'll explode and that's a big thing in ceramics because water boils at 212. So if you've got, you know, a little bit of moisture on the inside of this big thing, 
it's going to need to get its way out and things explode um, at 212. So that's why like drying is so important and I'm working seasonally. So I'm a teacher. So summer is a big making time and it works out perfect because it's damp in, in May and June and I'm starting to do all that mixing. And then by the time they're poured in, in August and September, when it's dry enough, you think your work is drying out. And then the best time for me to fire is fall and early winter. So that's a great seasonal, you know, cycle for me of making and then firing. And once they're fired, I open up the kiln and it's everything from tears and disaster to like unbelievable beauty and everything in between. I've had things where I've like ruined kilns. Um, in grad school, because I went too tall and they, they fell over and leaned. And I'll show you a piece over here, like leaned into the elements and I had to like cart, rip it out and replace, you know, I had to pay like, you know, 500, 600 bucks to fix the side of a kiln. Um, all the way to like, they just out of the kiln, they're like, oh, beautiful right away. So at some point I was like, I'm going to cut these things open. You can see the cut lines, which is interesting, kind of like when you drive through like um, West Virginia, and you can see like blast lines in the high off the highway. You can see where they cut through, and some of these pieces, you know, I'll they'll sit in a corner for like you know five, seven, ten years, and I'll, then I'll cut it open, and it's like Christmas, like it's like reborn again, and I'm like super excited about this piece that I didn't even think about, you know, that I thought it was just kind of ugly, and then all of a sudden it's beautiful and my favorite new thing, you know. So that's again what keeps me coming back to um, the ceramics and clay and working this way there's clay in the guggenheim and there's clay you know at a, at a coffee shop for like ten dollars for a mug you know and everything in between i've shown these before where i'll hang them up wet and they crack and crumble in the gallery space and fall off um, and then reveal what's behind it if you want to survive the long haul you need a plan b which could be like you know how are you going to make money because it is hard to make money being an artist, you know. Um, some people do it, clearly, but it, it's and it's definitely hard work, but be prepared to be, like, poor for a long time. But also, like, you know, I for me, it was education. Some people, it's graphic design or it's, the, you know, whatever it is, you know, to have, like, to have some income. You know, I couldn't survive without my partner. Like, my wife is has really um, given me stability, like, mentally physically we have children um she's she's the graphic designer in the family and really helps me with like you know photo editing and in, and and instagram and website stuff and um so you know and a friend of mine told me once he's like you know what, man every successful artist i know like has a good partner i've realized or thought about i'm like hmm that's a really I mean, it's not that profound or anything, but of course, like support family, you know, loved ones there that if having a solid base or, back, or your core family is really going to help you. You're going to be able to work hard and stay up late and work physical hours and and be there the first one there and the last one to leave. If you want to be successful, it's not calling or writing in if you want to be successful in art. You have to if you want to be the best or be even, you know, up there with them, you got to be able to really bust your ass and work really, really, really hard. And then when you think it's done, keep working hard.